Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Chris Marsden. Professor Marsden recently moved from Sussex Law School in the UK to Monash University in Australia, where he is Professor of Artificial Intelligence, Technology and the Law. He is an expert on internet and digital technology law with a focus on regulation by code, whether legal, software or social code. He is the author of many scholarly contributions, as well as five books, including Net Neutrality, Regulating Code with Professor Ian Brown, and Internet Co-Regulation. Okay, Chris, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. So let me put the first question on screen and read it out loud. How do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telcos. So the, the first thing to say is that I thought this was all settled uh, policy, uh, and a lot of us were were active. Uh, you mentioned the, the net neutrality book. Well, I wrote a net neutrality book in 2010, which was saying this American policy is coming to Europe. It will be a policy because it's about citizens' rights, not just about competition between telcos and and big content. Uh, and then I wrote a 2017 book, which I thought was just the postscript. It was, okay, we have a net neutrality law. It's now what's settled law. It's unlikely to ever be changed. Uh, that's a battle that will not be fought again. So it's been a real uh, eye-opener to realize that we're now having to have this debate again. Uh, and, and just so that it's clear to everybody, internet traffic has been growing over uh, 40 years. Uh, but over the commercial internet, it's been growing strongly in Europe over the last 25 years. But it's been growing more slowly over those 25 years. Uh, and when I say more slowly, that's year on year. And that's because of the fact that, that we're be becoming a, a more mature in information society. We have a much more mature way in which we look at these things. Uh, and so I thought it was fairly well established now that the internet traffic in Europe is growing more and more slowly. Uh, Mobile traffic, of course, took off very, very strongly around 2010. Uh, and, but this has been driven by users wanting to access more and more content of different types. Uh, and that this has contributed very, very strongly to demand uh, for them to have faster uh, connections, which has been very, very good for telecoms companies. And so I thought it was fairly well established that when the telcos were saying 10, 15 years ago that this is somehow a zero-sum game, and that the more people look at content, somehow the poorer telcos become. The politicians have understood that this is a positive sum game, mm -hmm. that the more people look at content, A, the more money the content players obviously get through uh, really terrible advertising and all those other things that they use to, to fund themselves, including to some extent subscriptions, although subscriptions to companies like Netflix are, of course, decreasing now. Uh, but also the telcos made a lot more money because we as users are very happy to pay much more money for a more stable, faster connection. Uh, and I should say it's really been very, very noticeable uh, in telcos' own statistics how much people have been willing to invest more money in faster connections through this awful pandemic that we've had for the last now almost three years. People are willing to pay more for fiber to the home or for much more reliable uh, connections, and the threatened um, spike in content use and therefore the, the increase that we expected to see in, in, in uh, uh, traffic over networks through the pandemic never happened to anything like the extent that we feared. So there was a big panic that people might remember back in March 2020 uh, when Commissioner Breton uh, persuaded YouTube and Netflix that they shouldn't be putting on 4K video, ultra high definition video during the day uh, because the politicians were scared that we would be sitting at home and instead of deleting email that we would actually be watching high quality movies instead. And the fact is that people are not uh, watching 4K ultra high definition uh, content anything like as much as either Hollywood or the telcos predicted in 2020 or 2018. Um, and I've, I've seen the latest statistics uh, from the uh, producers showing that the total amount of traffic, which is 4K, which is ultra high def, is something like under 10% of total traffic. 
which means that's actually less than 2% of viewing. Um, it turns out that we like watching Borgen, we like watching everything else in, in the high definition, and that's good enough for most people. M most of us don't watch a lot of ultra high definition. Most gamers don't do a lot of ultra high definition. The, the threatened content explosion has been in people's imaginations, not in reality. So how do I interpret the relationship? As pretty much the same as it has been for the last 20 years, which is that it's symbiotic. People like watching content, not in revolutionary new ways, but they like watching content over the, uh, over the internet. That's good for the companies that produce that content. Uh, it's good for the advertisers as well, which I think is a whole much more interesting debate, which Brussels doesn't like having very much because it's even more complicated. Uh, but of course, it's also really good for the telcos because people are investing in much faster connections. Uh, so to be honest, I don't see this relationship as changing very much. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't for the fact that the commissioners and the parliament are now discussing um, this new, this, this attempt to change our settled policy, I would say I have nothing to add on the subject. But clearly, clearly we have to repeat it because the telcos are suggesting something has changed, but I don't see any proof of that. So basically, um, our networks did not um, get filled in by content or exploded uh, during COVID when we were all at home using them. We were able to continue working. Um, our kids were able to continue uh, following school, more or less. Uh, and, and, and the relationship is one of a virtuous circle, not a vicious circle, like some would, would want us to think it is of, of, of feeding into um, you know, um, demand being translated into higher subscription fees by uh, users. Maybe even slightly more virtuous than, than I, I suggested at the outset, because what has happened is obviously telcos are very concerned about 5G network build out and investment in that. And there were big concerns early on in the development of 5G that there would be lots and lots of congestion uh, with the first uh, first 5G deployments in city centers and that people would somehow get a bad service that would put them off 5G because that had previously happened with 4G and 3G where you you know you release the service and then users basically overwhelm it. But of course, this hasn't happened through the pandemic because so many people have been working from home on Wi-Fi. And of course, Wi-Fi means that even if you're using your iPhone or your smartphone, you're actually using the fixed line network, that actually the 5G networks have been able to quite gently uh, develop in uh, in urban areas because we haven't had you know in the middle of Brussels or the middle of London or in the middle of Berlin millions of people at rush hours overtaxing the network. Mm -hmm. So in actual fact, for for some of the deployment possibilities, it's been much smoother than it would have been without the pandemic. Well, that, that's a positive side of the pandemic. No one thought of. I mean, it's um, not. I'm not saying it's something anyone intended to happen, but it has <laughs> been the case that we have been using our fixed networks and we've taken strain off mobile networks to a very substantial extent. It's not just our cars we've been using less as a result of the pandemic. It's also our mobile networks. Mm -hmm. Even if we've been sitting on our phones doom scrolling and, you mm -hmm. know, looking at whatever the latest terrible news is, the fact is we've been doing that mainly on Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, and so actually the pressure on the mobile networks has been decreased. Uh, over the pandemic, it's, uh, yeah, that's that, that's uh, an interesting factual uh, um, assessment, which you know uh, is true. I think for most of us, um, except maybe um, my 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 daughter when she's in her room and considers the Wi-Fi is not good enough. <laughs> Let's call her the exception. Um, and this this is a statement actually about the increased speeds that we're now getting over the mobile network that we are now being able to think about substituting one for the other. If you, if you like, you can almost say that we've all become a little bit Finnish during the pandemic. Because in <laughs> Finland, people have been talking about whether or not you can, you know, the speeds of mobile networks have been so impressive that people have been talking about substituting mobile for fixed. That's a slightly separate conversation than this thing about about uh, big tech and the, and the telco networks. Uh, but it's actually a really interesting point that, that people are substituting 4 and 5G for, um, uh, for the uh, Wi-Fi network. You talked about doomsday scrolling. Let, let, let's look at a, a doomsday scenario that is being projected in, in Brussels um, and, and look at our second question, which is 
what are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos? So I suppose one the first thing to say is that it's that the question says of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos. Well, of course, the suggestion is that all uh, providers of content have to pay the telcos. So it, it's not just about, I call them the GAFAM companies, Google, uh, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, uh, and Facebook. Uh, I've done that in a slightly different order. Uh, which, which, of course, by the way, doesn't the, calling them GAFAM is something that we said a couple of years ago. And then, of course, Google tried to spoil it by calling themselves Alphabet. Uh, and Facebook tries to spoil it by calling themselves Meta in a desperate <laughs> attempt to distract. Uh, but the fact is, those big five are the companies that people tend to worry about. And those big five, of course, are already going to be regulated much more strictly by the uh, by the Digital Markets Act, right? Mm -hmm. So we've already got a piece of legislation in place uh, for which DG Competition is apparently recruiting 150 more people. There's been a budget uh, increase that's been approved by the European Parliament. So we're already regulating those companies in a way which will be much stricter going forwards. But when we're talking about um, uh, essentially sending party pays, which is which is about this principle that all of the content providers pay the, the telco networks, uh, that's about all of them, including the much smaller ones. I think it's not fully understood, even in Brussels, I say even in Brussels, uh, with the more informed technology uh, policy uh, people, it's not necessarily fully understood that, for instance, Twitter is not captured by the Digital Markets Act, because a lot of us who are, you know, all of the policy wonks, all of the lobbyists, all of the people around the policy circles, we all really like Twitter. And I hate to break it to all of us, but we're not actually very cool. And it turns out that most people don't use Twitter in Europe. Uh, and Twitter is not big enough uh, to be captured by the Digital Markets Act and is actually a pretty small provider. So we tend to get obsessed with particular networks that actually aren't very big content providers at all. Um, I will say another one, I think, of the, of the, of the dangers of, of, of encompassing all of the technology uh, content providers in, in, in having to pay the telcos um, uh, is obviously this principle of network neutrality. Uh, we already have dangers, which is the telcos and indeed the content providers are being asked to filter traffic to check for copyright, uh, which is a, a particular danger that we have. Uh, there's an assumption which is being built into a lot of these plans, which is that it's really a small group of very big companies on both sides of the debate. Uh, and that just isn't the case. Uh, and so I think that the, what the danger is very simple, which is the danger is that what you're doing is putting in regulatory uh, proposals that will make sure that there are very few big tech companies. Um, and those very few big tech, tech companies, call them, I call them GAFAM again, those companies can afford to pay the telcos in any way that they need to. You mentioned I'm, I'm sitting here in Melbourne. Um, and in, in uh, Australia, we have this news bargaining code, which is a way of the very big uh, news organizations, uh, Mr. Murdoch's newspapers, for instance, which have th uh, two thirds to three quarters of the newspaper market in Australia. Yeah, it's that much of the market. It's an incredibly high uh, number. Uh, so Mr. Murdoch and also the, the major commercial net, uh, TV networks being paid by big tech. Now, that's fine. that has nothing to do with democracy. That has nothing to do with uh, market entrance. That has nothing to do with uh, the flourishing of innovation. That's just basically a, a tax on the big tech companies to pay these big news providers. It's a political deal done under the previous government here in Australia. And if we try to move towards this, uh, this model that the telcos are suggesting, that's the danger. It doesn't hurt the really big content providers because they are truly enormous. But it affects the people at the margins, on the, uh, uh, particularly on the, on the content provider side. So, you know, if you want to hammer big tech, that's what the Digital Markets Act was for. Mm. And if that's what, and also to some extent, that's what the Copyright Directive, I suppose, um, is doing, although it's, again, the danger is the copyright directive doesn't affect the big tech companies because they already have the technological filters in place to deal with it. So the dangers are that you're basically just a, a, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are helping big tech by increasing the barriers to being able to provide content over networks. Mm. 
Um, and I remember when we were first discussing net neutrality back in the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, uh, the big discussion that came up was about the state broadcasters. So ARD and ZDF and France Television, and BBC and, and the other state broadcasters who said, if you introduce charges for content to be carried across these telco networks, you're essentially going to be forcing the state broadcasters to pay the telco networks to provide content that the public's already paid for. And then there's only one policy option, isn't there? Because they don't, the only policy option is either you make an exception for the state broadcasters, mm. which creates nightmarish situations in terms of trying to decide what is and isn't a state broadcaster, which are deeply political, mm. and which I would suggest the European Parliament and the European Commission really don't want to get involved in. Uh, that is what was suggested 20 years ago to be a career ending uh, decision by any bureaucrat who tries to get involved in that. Uh, at the European level, because it erases so many national mm. exceptions. Or you say, right, well, we can't regulate the state broadcasters because we'd be capturing a vulnerable class of, again, you'd be effectively asking the public to pay for the content the state broadcasters have, and then the state broadcasters pay that to the telcos, which is a kind of double taxation of the public. So we already have faced this problem 15 years ago, and it was pretty well established that if you want to go after the big tech companies, create policy options that are just for the big tech companies. Um, and we have that with the Digital Markets Act. I, I would say just one other uh, element to that, which is really interesting, is um, people have been in Brussels a very long time. We'll remember the suggested bit tax uh, from 1994. Uh, <laughs> the idea that all content that goes over the internet is taxed. And the reason why we didn't do that at the time, this was... Uh, a suggestion of Luc Serta, uh, the very famous economist who was an advisor at the time uh, to the employment uh, commissioner, uh, the Irish commissioner, who was the employment commissioner. And the reason we didn't do that back in 94, 95 is because we realized that innovative small companies would be subject to this just as big companies are. And it's only a few years ago that I recall the chief executive of Deutsche Telekom saying, well, of course, we'll encourage all content companies to use our specialized services and it's the specialized services that will give them guaranteed quality of service to their users. Um, and we could call that, and he, he definitely said this at the time, I could go back and check records for you, uh, the startup innovation tax that they will pay to Deutsche Telekom. So if the big telcos want big tech to pay more, then they could encourage them to have this guaranteed quality of service on their specialized services. I haven't seen that. Uh, have you seen that happen? I haven't seen that happen. There is this exception in the open internet regulation that permits them to charge more for this guaranteed quality of service. And if they really felt that that was important, then they should be able to persuade a big tech that they should do that. What's happened instead, of course, is that big tech has spent billions and billions and billions uh, of euros on content delivery networks, mm. which are telco networks to provide gigantic pipes to move the content around the world. So the big tech companies are actually gigantic internet traffic companies, as well as being content providers. And they've done this on an epic scale. Uh, anyone who uh, uh, has spent any amount of time, I don't encourage the podcast audience to do this, but anyone who spent any amount of time looking at internet, uh, the internet backbone, uh, internet traffic, uh, particularly the laying of cables uh, uh, that are laid under the oceans, will be aware that the biggest players in this field are the big content companies, particularly uh, Google and Facebook, or rather their corporate names. Um, alphabet and meta. <laughs> yeah, um, so so um, actually, you, you you started answering a bit of the third question. So let me switch quickly to that one, because um, in in the different papers that came out recently, um, there were um, uh, comparisons between investments, and the question is, do you think it's appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech? and telecom operators in infrastructure as suggested by some? I think the issue is that there's two parts of the infrastructure. So there's the, there's the last mile, last kilometer local delivery, 
uh, which of course is where users are paying the telcos for upgrades to their service. Um, and that last kilometer, of course, includes 5G networks because 5G, of course, now involves so many base stations that ultimately uh, it people perhaps misunderstand the nature of 5G and, in fact, the nature the nature of mobile in general. Mobile is only mobile for the last piece of the of the uh, of the journey. So actually, from the local base station to your phone, the rest of the mobile network is actually using fiber optic cable because they're not crazy. I mean, of course, you're not using over-air distribution of, of bulk signals. So essentially, a mobile network is a fiber optic network with base stations at the ends of it, and lots and lots of base stations. I don't underestimate how much investment that, that requires. Um, but that local piece is, of course, what users are particularly paying for um, when they're paying the telecoms companies. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the backbone, so the, the content delivery piece, the the piece which goes from what we used to call local exchanges, although that doesn't really apply quite so much anymore, um, across countries and around the world, uh, you could certainly compare the investments of big tech and telcos. Telcos wouldn't like it very much because I suspect you'll find big tech has been investing more than the telcos in that entire uh, backhaul piece of the of the network. Um, so. You know, there's those two pieces. The local piece, the, the actual last kilometer delivery, um, is the piece that is being upgraded and is the piece where, of course, users are paying for those mm -hmm. upgrades because, as we said, the last three years have focused everybody's mind. Um, I'm a law professor and, you know, judges are now, uh, or over the last three years, have heard lots of, of cases at home which is something that and if you'd said on the 1st of March 2020 that judges would be listening to to the next two years of their of their judicial career judging cases at home over uh, over a webcam, they would have thought you were absolutely crazy. But that's what they've done. And you don't have to be a judge to take advantage of fiber to the home. People have been paying telcos very large amounts of money to upgrade their infrastructure. And when you look at telco accounts, you can see just how much people are paying extra. Um, so, yeah, of course, for that piece, I absolutely accept that the telcos are doing a job there. Um, sadly, at the moment, there is a little bit of a supply chain issue in the delivery of fiber optic cable, mm -hmm. uh, which is an issue both for the backhaul and also for the local con uh, connectivity piece of the network. Um, but, yeah, th there are very large investments going on. And big tech and also the telcos have been investing very large amounts. I will say there is another piece of this, which is much less known, I think, to the politicians, which is the extraordinary sums of money which big tech are paying for, uh, uh, for data farms, for server farms, mm -hmm. um, for cloud computing. And that is tens of billions of euros that are being spent. Uh, it goes, it, it basically, politicians take an interest because they're suddenly aware of the amount of electricity and even the amount of water that is required to power and to cool these uh, uh, these uh, server farms or oh, data warehouses, call them what you will. It, it's changed slightly over the years, the terminology. That investment is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an investment which, yes, of course, telcos are also making that investment. I don't underestimate the extent to which telcos do uh, provide storage for their clients as well but the increase in storage capacity uh, from the from big tech has been much much greater uh, and in particular uh, those big five uh, amazon alphabet microsoft in particular those three companies have invested so hugely in the cloud computing market uh, that they are providing uh, vast vast amounts of storage as well as the network infrastructure uh, for uh, for those investments. Uh, and I will say one of the remarkable things over the whole pandemic has been the extent to which we have actually seen some innovation in um, what you might call smaller tech. So if you told me, again, we've just talked about the judges not expecting to be judging online in, in March 2020. If you told me that the big winners of the pandemic would be Zoom and TikTok, <laughs> I would have been, I mean, I don't have teenage kids, so I don't know the influence <laughs> of TikTok quite. My students tell me constantly about the extraordinary changes that have taken place. Um, 
Uh, and also they talk about Be Real, which is the latest. Mm. It's our attempt at uh, <laughs> encouraging us to share our, um, uh, our intimate details with our uh, nearest and dearest. But, you know, there has been innovation. And I think that it's really important to remember that there is still room for lots of innovation in content. We are not at the end of the the end of history where there is a big five companies and that they will be providing all of our connectivity together with, say, Netflix and Twitter. There really is still room for new companies to come in, which is, I think, I mean, I think it's, I don't want to talk about the individual business models of TikTok in particular, because, of course, there's a national security concern there. But I just think it is encouraging and engaging that we do have even more different opportunities for content to be provided. Um, and, you know, we prov- we've spent two and a half years on Zoom without breaking the network either. Uh, I will say that, that one thing which very distinctly marks out Zoom from some of the other providers is, um, is this parlor game that we've all been able to play for the last two and a half years, which is watching the, um, the closed captioning, the subtitles that Zoom provides uh, for real-time conversations. Uh, which is a, a definite demonstration that there are there are opportunities for AI to become a much more effective interpreter mm-hmm. of our words. Uh, the natural language processing of Zoom is um, uh, at an early stage. I'll say that. <laughs> um, I, I sense the professor in in artificial intelligence uh, coming up on that one, and and. Um, on your Zoom comment and judges at home, I think everyone remembers the poor lawyer that used the cat filter during Zoom hearings um, <laughs> of a court case in the United States. Which Who knows, we are a rather horrible immigration lawyer. So actually, I, I, I encourage everyone to enjoy the humiliation of that particular image. <laughs> That's uh, you know, kind of happened um, to a nicer person. <laughs> and and I, and I think it shows that you know the internet um, is is innovating, changing, getting different shapes, but the commonality all through the internet is cats. <laughs> it is, it's all about cats. <laughs> of course. And I will say one reason why the telcos constantly lose these debates is because the inability to memify their uh, uh, their attempts at arguments is, is, is a, a definite demonstration of their lack of understanding of the, of the cat's nature of the internet. <laughs> Um, so we're reaching the end of this po- podcast, and that means that you have your soapbox moment. I'm, I'm putting the two strong ladies of Brussels uh, on screen, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, Roberta Metzola, President of the European Parliament. Uh, now is your opportunity to tell them, you know, um, all, all, what, all the wisdom and expertise that you've gathered over all of these years discussing net neutrality, rediscussing net neutrality, and now for a third time explaining it. What, what your conclusions are? So I think that there's a really simple thing to, to say, first of all, which is that the European Commission and the European Parliament held a joint summit in 2011 in Brussels, which I was asked to speak at. And when I was speaking there, um, the guest list was such that I had to say, I'm not sure why I'm actually being invited to speak to this summit, because I am actually not opposed to net neutrality. And so I think that they will have to recognize that 80%, 90% of the people they listen to in Brussels will tell them that somehow the internet is breaking and that that is why the rules have to be changed. Very simple um, message for them. The internet is not breaking. The speed of increase of traffic is decreasing. There was a little bit of an increase in traffic in 2020 when we all went home. Mm -hmm. Uh, But over the longer term, you will see the speed of increase of traffic is decreasing. The network, which was predicted to be broken in 2006 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and all the way through this entire internet debate, uh, uh, internet neutrality debate, it is not broken. If they really want to revisit everything that we discussed uh, when we were discussing the fact that we needed to to encourage both sides to have a positive sum uh, investment in the internet, they're very welcome to read a very long and, and frankly, too detailed book that I wrote in 2017, which was the one after we'd passed the open internet uh, regulation that explained how much of the debate had been based on, uh, I'll call it disinformation, information that was not accurate about how the network was growing. So they should be very careful about making public statements that 
somehow internet traffic is growing too fast for investment to keep up with it. Because those profits of doom, which have been around for 25 years, are incorrect. Um, I will admit now, for a very short period, 20 years ago, I worked for WorldCom, and those with very and and for those people listening to this podcast who don't remember WorldCom, just look up the prediction that traffic was doubling every hundred days. There are lies, damned lies, and predictions of fast internet traffic growth. We can deal with it. We always have dealt with it. We will deal with it in future. There is no need to break the model, which has been so successful for those twenty-five years. Thank you, Chris. I think that that was uh, extremely clear. Um, and um, yeah, let's um, to a certain extent, it's it's maybe frustrating for legislators to hear that they shouldn't be legislating something. But as you said, if it's if it's not broken and it certainly is not going to break, um, then it doesn't require fixing. And if you think it should be fixed, then make it an evidence based solution and not just uh, listening to random claims. <laughs> let's put it that way. I can add one more terrible thing for them, Caroline, which is that if they really think it needs changing, then they will need to read. I, I was on the advisory committee for the, the report uh, on the three-year evaluation of the open internet regulation. So this was published in 2019 by the European Commission. They should read that 550-page report and see whether that analysis across all European member states suggested that they need to make any radical adjustments to the open internet regulation. If they can't bring themselves to read that report, then they have no business amending the regulation if they're not willing to look at the evidence. That's less than, it's three years old, the report. So it's very, uh, it's, it's relatively recent in terms of this debate. And, it's, and it was a very exhaustive analysis of the open internet regulation. And it said it's working fine. Well, on, on, on this positive note, uh, except for the fact that, you know, you've just given them their reading list. <laughs> what can I do is the evidence. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for your contribution, uh, Chris. And I'm sure that we will continue our discussion uh, once there are more detailed things coming out of the Brussels bubble. Thank you so much. Thank you.